Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Professor Miscellaneous Gab and welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to be going over a completely comprehensive Dune glossary. This is for those of you who have watched part one, who have maybe even read the book, who have maybe even seen part two and are thinking, what is going on with this world? Why are there so many names? Why does Paul Atreides have more names than Voldemort? And how am I supposed to make sense of this vast and complex world that feels more complicated than Star Wars. I'm here to clarify that. And maybe, maybe you're feeling all those things and you're afraid to do some research because you know that might give you some very crucial spoilers either for Dune Part 2 or for the other movies slash books to come. Have no fear because I am here to help. We're going to get nerdy today. Everything that you need to know to gain a comprehensive grip on not only the story, but the world in which we are operating. I'm going to get into terms used in Dune why they're important, and then some of the origins of those words, how Frank Herbert came up with these terms, why they matter. So if you enjoy words at all, or if you just want to get to know the Dune story more in a spoiler-free way, this video is for you. Now, like I said, this video will contain zero spoilers for Dune Part 2, and for that second half of the Dune book, who am I? I've read the first three books. I've seen the first movie. I haven't seen Dune Part 2 because, like I said in my last video, which which if you haven't watch, you should definitely watch. It's revisiting Dune Part 1, everything you missed, everything you need to know for Dune Part 2. I live on a tiny little island. I have to take a ferry and then a plane and then a taxi and then go to the movie theater and see Dune Part 2, which I am doing this week. But in order to assuage my FOMO, I decided to make another Dune video less than 24 hours after I put out my last one. And it's also a reason for me to have an excuse to keep making more AI Dune characters of myself. So buckle up, get a snack, get some hydration, get a wine, get a coffee, and join me as we nerd out together and get to know the universe of Dune just a little bit more. Now, Frank Herbert got a lot of his naming inspiration from Arabic, Latin, and Hebrew. A lot of these words will have crossovers into some of those languages. Frank Herbert took a lot of liberty with those words, and I think he kind of put them all together to create his own meaning. So take those with a grain of salt. If I've made any mistakes in this video, which I really hope I haven't, feel free to point it out. We're all here to learn. So it's important important to understand the first term that we're going to go over, this is overarching, is the Butlerian Jihad. Some of you might have heard the term Jihad before. This is maybe known as the first Jihad, and it certainly won't be the last. The Butlerian Jihad took place about 10,000 years before the beginning of the Dune story as we know it. This was known as the Great Revolt. It's sometimes shortened just to be called the Jihad as well. And this was a crusade against computers thinking machines, and AI. wonder if we're going to have one of those. Basically, AI, thinking machines, computers, they kind of came into the picture, threatened to take over the human race and what really makes a human a human. And people said, uh-uh, not on my watch. This is not happening here. And they got rid of them. They killed a bunch of people. It lasted about 100 years. And then you were left with this aftermath. And that was super important with creating some of the systems, some of the types of roles, some of the types of people, the schools of training, and the great houses that we see in the Dune world as we know it. Next part I want to talk about are the planets. Where the heck are we? What are these planets? Dune part one has these introductions to the planets, like, hey, we're on Kaladin. Hey, we're on Gady Prime. Here's where we are. But maybe you don't really know what that means or it happened so fast that you're not quite sure. Let's start with Kaladin. Kaladin is the ancestral home of the Atreides family, and it has been for many generations. It is a lush oceanic world. We don't get to spend too much time on Kaladin. What we see and read is super important just to understand the contrast between Arrakis and Kaladin. The Atreides are coming from a lush, they're known for their agriculture, it's known for water falling out of the sky, which might feel quite normal to you, but quite unbelievable to the Fremen. Then we have Gady Prime. Gady Prime is the ancestral home of House Harkonnen. We see it very briefly in Dune Part 1. I know we see a lot more of it in Dune Part 2. Gady Prime is known for its high levels of industry and production and low levels of photosynthesis. Basically, the Harkonnen, because of their cruel rule, they clearly don't care about sustainability. If there was ever a house 
that does not care about sustainability. It is House Harkonnen. So they have tried to maximize industrial output while minimizing production costs. That results in a lot of the natives being used as slave laborers, unfortunately, but it has helped their rise and their ascension to one of the great houses, houses major. Next, let's get into Seleucus Secundus. So we see a brief flash of Seleucus Secundus in Dune Part 1. It's very scary. There are sacrifices. There's throat singing. And Seleucus Secundus is important for two reasons. One, it is the home world of House Carino, which is the royal imperial family. It is known for being a very harsh world, minimal plant life with extreme temperatures and difficult terrain. It is also known as the Carino prison planet. So this is where House Carino would send all of their political enemies, prisoners, rule breakers, and they would go on to live a very harsh existence. The second reason why Seleucus Secundus is so important is because it is the home of the Sardaukar, which to many is the most powerful army in the universe. We'll get into the Sardaukar when we talk about the people and the groups in this world. Now, if you want to read a really interesting discussion about the naming origins of Seleucus Secundus, I'm not going to go ahead and talk about all that right now, but there's a really great Reddit post that I highly recommend. They kind of get into the etymology of the word, so if you want to super nerd out, go check that out. Finally, for the purposes of this discussion, we have Arrakis. Now, Arrakis is also referred to as dune. Arrakis originates from an, the Arabic word for dancer. It's known for its brutal environment, lack of water, and of course, the spice melange, as well as minimal life, but important life, such as the sandworm and the kangaroo mouse, which will come in to importance for a naming convention in a moment here. It's also home to the Fremen. One of the key strongholds of Arrakis is the city of Arakeen. This is where the satellite rulers of Arrakis set up their state their armies, their people. It has a giant shield wall to protect from the sandworms. Now that we've talked about the planets, now that we've established where the heck are we, let's talk about the different houses. So I'm going to go into the, the couple house majors as well as uh, the a couple of the house miners. I have not seen Dune Part 2, so I do not know how much of a role some of these play, but I do know that they're important in the second half of the Dune book as well as later Dune books. So first we have, let's start with the bad guys, House Harkonnen, the bald, pale, Voldemort looking mother. As you may be able to tell from the name, Harkonnen has Scandinavian roots. House Harkonnen is thought to have originated from Finland or Sweden back when Earth was a thing. Their rulers are known as barons, so most notably Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, who is, we've already talked about this, disgusting. They, house Harkonnen spent many years as a house miner. They have been trying to get to the big leagues for a long time. That's kind of why they're jealous and a little bit butthurt about House Atreides and their respect and loyalty, where House Atreides may command a lot of loyalty and love. House Harkonnen inspires a lot of fear and hate. They're known for being very brutal. They're known for the industrialization of their planet. In the movie, we see them represented as very bald, white, kind of alien, creepy looking guys. Guys. This isn't necessarily a book thing, but I do think the movie took an interesting design choice. You might argue that because of the lack of photosynthesis and potentially what they've done to destroy their own planet's environment, may be somewhat contributing to really pale people. I personally love how the Harkonnen are portrayed in the movie. I think it adds an element of fear. I won't spend too much time on House Atreides, one, because I forgot to record them the first time around, but two, because I think we already know a lot about House Atreides. So House Atreides is a house major, one of the most prominent houses that came up after the Butlerian Jihad. Their rulers are known as Dukes, such as Duke Leto. Legend has it to have descended Descended from the late great King Agamemnon. Some of you might remember him from Troy and the Odyssey and the Iliad. They rule over the planet Kaladin until they are selected by the emperor to become the new ruler and presider over Arrakis. Then we have House Fenring. This is a also a major house and it's a satellite of House Carino. They served as satellites and ambassadors on Dune as well. There is a Mentat Fenring, I believe. There is a Lady Fenring who is a Bene Gesserit. She's the one, if you watch my last video, who leaves a note to Lady Jessica in the first half of the Dune book to be like, 
hey, you guys are in trouble. I got you, girl. But overall, they play a somewhat important role in the books. I think they're downplayed a little bit in the films. Next, we have House Raban. House Raban is a house miner that's very closely associated with House Harkadin. The two most notable people we see from House Raban are the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen's two nephews. So we have Glossu Raban, who is played by Juan Batista in the movies. He's known for being the very brutal who comes in as the next ruler of Dune and his brother Fade Raltha, who's also a legendary fighter, also quite known for his brutality and ambition. Even though we haven't met Fade Raltha in part one because they're saving him for part two, Baron Harkonnen really prefers Fade Raltha to the beast Raban, his nephew. Next, let's get into House Carino. They are and have been for a long time one of the most powerful houses in the galaxy. They are the commanders of the Sardaukar army, which we'll get into in a second here. The Parashat emperors are the hereditary rulers of House Carino, and House Carino will continue to play an important role in the books, and I imagine a very important role in Dune Part 2, so look out for that. Finally, although not a house, but very important to talk about, we have the Fremen. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the Fremen. Perhaps this is just some background information into the Fremen that maybe you don't want to read on the wiki because you're afraid of spoilers. Don't read the wiki if you don't want spoilers. The Fremen are the natives of the planet Arrakis. They are descendants from the Zen Sunni wanderers who many think are the ones who found the planet. While they have a rich oral history, it does get a little kittywampus, so we don't know exactly a lot of their, their past and their legacy. The brutal environment of Arrakis has made them quite amazing masters of resources Sources, primarily water. They're very deeply religious and almost superstitious people. They have a spiritual connection to spice, spiritual connection to water, and a spiritual connection to the sandworms. They live in patriarchal collectives known as CHs, led by a Naib. I think that's how you say it, I forget. And they dwell in the rocky formations of Arrakis. They wear complex body filtration suits known as still suits, which allows them to survive for weeks in the desert and retain as much of their body's moisture as possible. One thing that I discussed very briefly in my last video, but when two Fremen fight and duke it out, they're supposed to do it without still suits. And the winner of the fight, which is always to the death, actually gets to receive the water from their fallen foe. So they take the body. I don't know what they do, but they do something that gets all the juices and water out. And that is supposed to be not only his reward for the win, but also as a way to help revive him from the strain of the fight. They're known for having the eyes of Ibad, which are the crazy glowing blue eyes due to their exposure and ingestion of the spice melange. Spice melange is also part of their diet and their rituals and just their whole world. So that's the Fremen. Now let's get into some more details that you might not know. We're going to be talking about kind of the roles that people occupy in this world. Let's get into the main ones that you need to know. So first we have the Bene Gesserit. Bene Gesserit are an exclusive sisterhood whose members are trained throughout the years through extreme physical and mental conditioning that starts at an early age. This allows them to obtain almost superhuman qualities and abilities. They have a bit of a bad rap, even though they're everywhere. So I've talked about this before. They often find their way into major houses by becoming the concubines, mistresses, as well as sometimes, if they're lucky, the wives of great lords and dukes and usually carry their female offspring, who then become Bene Gesserit. They are seen as witches because they have quite misunderstood powers. Now, the Bene Gesserit training school was actually the first school that was established after the Butlerian Jihad. Once they're like, okay, no more AI, time to start training this group of people who can master their own emotions, their minds, their physiological, everything. They, they are also a political force to be dealt with. They are everywhere. Whether people are like it or not, they're everywhere. If you want to win anything, you need the Bene Gesserit on your side. The name Bene Gesserit has its roots in Latin as well as Hebrew. With the Bene Gesserit, it is chicks before dicks. It is hoes before bros. They are always there for their fellow sister, or at least they're supposed to be. So even though they are bound to great houses in ways, they are the mothers of future leaders. Some of their powers include oral analysis, so being able to detect the if somebody is lying, if there's fear in their voice, if there's confidence in their voice, they are really good at just detecting the minutia in oral speech. They are also known for being able to control their bodies on a chemical 
compound level. They also have power over their own fertility so they can choose, which they're always supposed to do, to carry daughters instead of sons. Lady Jessica looking at you. They're also known for prana bindu breathing, which is a way of slowing, changing their heart rate, their blood pressure. This allows them to remain calm, cool, and collected even in very stressful circumstances. They also have the voice. Now the voice is their own oral mastery at a certain frequency that almost acts like mind control. It is very hard for people to resist. In the book, it gets a lot more into kind of their suggestive manipulation that they use their femininity and their sex appeal to also have control and influence over those around them. Kind of going off of the Bene Gesserit, we also have the Reverend Mother, who is a Benny Gesserit in her advanced stages as well as the main Reverend Mother. So there's one Reverend Mother Superior, the lady in the black shroud. The Reverend Mothers are only created during the Water of Life ritual. It is where she inherits the genetic memory of all of her sisters. Like I said, you only become a Reverend Mother after drinking the Water of Life. This is something we will see in Dune Part 2. The Water of Life is also known as the Spice Agony. It's a a blue liquid I'm reading here that comes from the bile of a sandworm's stomach. One single drop is lethal to those who have not completed the Bene Gesserit training and no man so far has survived drinking the water of life. Now let's get into a mentat. So I know that the movies don't really pay enough attention to the whole mentat thing. Mentats are also a specialized training school that allows, that helps people learn how to act like computers. So how to use your mind as a calculator. Once AI went bye-bye, once your precious MacBooks, they got thrown out in the bootlarian jihad, they really needed humans that were capable of thinking like computers. So mentats are known for exceptional cognitive abilities, pristine perspective and precision, computing power. They're able to compute vast sums of data and they really serve as political advisors to a lot of the great houses. Mentats are rare. Notable Mentats include Thufir Hawat with the Atreides family, Peter de Vries, who is killed in Dune Part 1. He was a Harkonnen Mentat. They are also supposed to operate in an ethical framework because as you can imagine, with great power comes great responsibility. And if you don't have a code of ethics that you abide by, you can probably do some shit. Mentats who abandon this ethical framework are known as twisted mentats. Piter de Vries was a twisted mentat. Movie didn't get into this, but it is Piter who discovered how to undo the conditioning of Dr. Yui, of the Souk doctor. So I will get into that. Because he is a twisted mentat, because he doesn't abide by the code of ethics, he is sort of the reason that they were able to orchestrate that betrayal of the Atreides family. Paul is also being trained as a mentat as well kind of makes Paul this like quadruple infinity threat. Typically leaders themselves are not mentats. They have mentats as political advisors. Now let's get into the Sardaukar. In terms of the naming origin, I did read one Reddit post that roots the Sardaukar name from Persian origin. Sardar meaning commander, ruler for some sort of imperial governance. And I didn't realize this, that the word gar in Persian is sort of a suffix that when attached to nouns kind of gives it that profession. The Sardaukar are the elite training force of the Padishah Emperor. They're known for their fighting ability and their ruthlessness. Because of the harsh environment from where they come, half of the Sardaukar die before they reach the age of 11. They remind me a lot of the Unsullied in Game of Thrones, where their existence is pretty much to fight and to kill. And like I said, they are known for being pretty much the most badass MCs in the galaxy. Now we're going to get into a guild navigator. Guild navigators have not uh, occupied much importance in Dune Part 1. They are extremely crucial in the book and they are also going to be important in Dune Part 2. In the beginning of the Dune book, so during the events that that should have been covered in Dune Part 1, we do see how important the guild navigators and which we'll get into later, the spacing guild 
are. Uh, there is a dinner party scene that takes place in the books that was removed from the movie. They did film it, but I guess Denny Villeneuve doesn't like to release an extended cut, which is quite unfortunate because if there's one thing I love about any kind of movie, any kind of world, it's the politicking. It's the political maneuvering. That's why those first few seasons of Game of Thrones were so good. That's what we love to see. We have these elite training schools that came as a response to the Butlerian Jihad. We have the Mentats, the Bene Gesserit, and we have the Guild. Guild navigators are an artificially evolved superhuman within the Spacing Guild. They consume massive amounts of spice, which allow them to navigate through the known universe, be able to detect objects in their path using prescience to avoid any dangers. Because like I said, they don't have GPS, they don't have AI, they don't have Siri, so they can't tell like, hey, there's a giant rock asteroid coming your way. They leverage their prescience from massive ingestations of spice to be able to do that. So without them, and also without spice, space travel in the years post Butlerian Jihad would be absolutely impossible. Because of the spice melange, they transform into amphibian-like creatures. They're portrayed as very greedy and gross, mutated, and they can't live without the spice melange. Now let's get into souk doctors. So the concept of souk doctors is very important to the first part of the Dune book, Dune part one. They're highly trained medical professionals who undergo imperial conditioning. Now imperial conditioning prevents them from taking human life. It is part of their code of ethics. It allows them to be this kind of universally trusted medical voice. And the diamond tattoo on their forehead is supposed to signify that they have completed imperial conditioning. Now, like I said, that little rascal Piter DeVries, that twisted mentat, he finds a way to undo that. In the book, there is this whole sniff out the rat plot going on. Is the rat Fufir? Is it Gurney Halleck? Is it Jessica? Is it Dr. Yui? And part of the reason why Dr. Yui is not suspected, even though Paul wonders if it's Dr. Yui, is because these doctors are supposed to be so freaking trustworthy. Dr. Yui. Uh -uh. Okay, next we have this term, which I don't believe we've heard in Dune Part 1. It is in the books. It will no doubt, hopefully, be in, in Dune Part 2, called Shai Halud. Shai Halud is another word for the sandworms, also known as makers. Sandworms, makers, Shai Halud occupy a very religious and spiritual part of the Fremen belief system, their society, everything. Sandworms are very crucial to the planet Dune. Let's just say that. I am teetering on the edge of a spoiler and I don't recall how much of a spoiler it is, so let's just put it at that. One thing that you can know about Shai Halud and the sandworms is that the Fremen tend to use them as ubers. How do they get off? Like, how do they pump the brakes? That's what I want to know. So we have a truth sayer, which is a person who can detect when the truth is being told. These are typically Bene Gesserit. They're used for political reasons. Truth sayers are more accurate than lie detector tests. So if there's one good thing, that came out of the Butlerian Jihad is that people stopped using lie detectors tests to try and prove someone's guilt or innocence. Now we just have a human being that can do that for us because humans are awesome, right? And they should not be replaced with AI or are they or should they? Finally, I am going to teeter around this term, but one term that is thrown around a lot in the books is the term abomination. Abomination is a Bene Gesserit term to describe individuals who have obtained that genetic, that ego memory, but cannot control it. They're known for their psychological instability. I'm not going to say any more about that, but keep that in mind. Bookmark that. Now we're going to get into names for Paul. Paul has a lot of names, and I don't even know if the movie is going to get into all these names for Paul, but Homeboy has a lot of names. So we talked in the last video about the Kwisatz Haderach. There's a few different interpretations of the meaning for this. It's a Hebrew origin word one who and, and this is not what it means in hebrew the origin of the word the root of the word is hebrew but within the dune realm it's supposed to be mean one who can be many places at once and a shortening of the way the kwisat tadarak is a male descendant of the Bene Gesserit breeding program it can only be a male this man will gain access to the entire past of genetic memory because he will inherit both male and female genetic memory now the kwisat tadarak was supposed to be jessica's grandson son rather than her son. She was supposed to have a daughter, the daughter Atreides, 
who would have married Fade Rautha, who was that guy that we talked about earlier. They were supposed to create the very powerful Kwisatz Haderach on the Bene Gesserit's terms. The other name for Paul is the Lisan Al-Gaib. So when he arrives on Dune, you hear a lot of the Fremen shouting Lisan Al-Gaib, Lisan Al-Gaib. Lisan Al-Gaib has its roots in Arabic. Arabic Lisan means tongue. Al-Gaib kind of means hidden unseen. That kind of translates directly into how Lisan Al-Gaib is referred to in the movie and books, which is the voice from the outer world. This is a Fremen prophecy that's been highly influenced by the Bene Gesserit, also translated as the giver of water. So the Bene Gesserit have been at work on Dune for a long time. The Lisan Al-Gaib, the voice from another world, is supposed to be this prophet that will come to Dune and help terraform the planet, essentially, and give life and give the gift of water to Dune. Another word kind of related to Paul is the Mahdi. This is a name given by the Fremen to describe their messiah, who is believed to be a non-native of Arrakis. Another word that has not come up in Dune Part 1, it happens right around the time of where Dune Part 1 ends when Paul kills Jameis, is Moadib. Now, Moadib is another word for a constellation that can be seen from Arrakis, as well as the cute little kangaroo mouse, which is one of the only furry living creatures on Arrakis. Moadib is chosen by Paul after he kills Jameis and essentially joins the Fremen. So he was asked by Stilgar in the books, hey, what do you like? What do you want your nickname to be? How do you want to be known around us? And Paul chose Moadib. I would say this is his main Arrakis name. There's also a, another kind of interpersonal Fremen name for Paul called Usul, a Fremen word meaning the strength of the base pillar. It was given to Paul by Stilgar when they reached C.H. Tabor. So where Moadib is his outward name, Usul Usul is his inward, interpersonal name by his buddies. However, Usul is used more as a loving term of affection by Cheney. In the book, we really mostly hear Cheney use the word Usul. And that's all from what I understand are the names for our boy Paul Atreides. Now let's get into the elements and objects of the world. So the Chris knives. I'm going to read here because I don't want to mess this up. These are important in the movies and the book. They're given more screen time in the books. However, it is a Chris knife that Cheney hands to Paul right before fight with Jameis. The Chris knife is a knife with a, the blade formed from the tooth of a dead sandworm. It is the weapon of choice for the Fremen, and it's typically laced with a fast-acting poison. There are two forms of Chris knives, the unfixed blades that disintegrate unless kept close to a human body's energetic field or fixed blades which do not disintegrate. They're very sacred weapons to the Fremen and it is believed that once a Chris knife is drawn, it cannot be put away until blood is drawn. Outsiders of the tribe are not allowed to see a Chris knife. If they do, they must be killed by it. So the first Chris knife we do see is in the first half of the Dune book in Dune part one where the shout out mapes. The Fremen woman who serves as an attendant to House Atreides has a Chris knife in her bodice. Jessica sees it, takes it, but is not killed by it, clearly. Then we have a still suit. This is the bodysuit worn on Arrakis. I've mentioned this earlier. It exists to preserve the body's moisture and make it possible to survive in the desert for weeks. While the Fremen are known to have created these still suits, there are these still suit manufacturers who have a monopoly on the planet Dune. They are actually very invested in Dune not becoming an oasis, in Dune never being terraformed. Because if Dune is terraformed, who's going to need still suits? Capitalism. Next, we have the Gom Jabbar. Now, this was shown in Dune Part 1. The Gom Jabbar is a poison needle that the Bene Gesserit use in the Gom Jabbar test of humanity. It determines if a person's awareness is stronger than their instincts. And the whole test of this Gom Jabbar is to test if you have control over your own instincts to whip your hand out, even if you know that means sudden death in the neck with the poison needle. And then finally, we have the golden path. That's another element and object of the world. That is the prescient interpretation only visible to the Kwisatz Haderach. So it foretells events of the future. The Kwisatz Haderach is supposed to have all memory of the past. And it's sort of up to them and only them 
to decide what's going to happen in the future. That means the Kwisa Tadarak is insanely powerful. Kind of makes sense why maybe the Bene Gesserit wanted to have a little bit more control over when he came into existence and where. Okay, last chapter is the powers that be. We're just going to touch very briefly on this. There are a lot of different names for the powers that be. I know Dune Part 1 didn't get super into the political dynamics of the universe. So we have the High Council, which is a body that represents the Great Houses and helps settle disputes. We have the Lancerot, which is a another body that represents the Great Houses. Well, no, the Harkonnen betrayed House Atreides. And really, that wouldn't have been possible with at least the knowledge and understanding of some of the Lancerot. It wasn't just evil Baron wanting to kill his political enemies. It's actually the Parishal Emperor House Carino. A lot of people were a bit nervous about House Atreides and how powerful they could become. So when they were up on the chopping block, everyone's like, Sure. Next, we have the Imperium, which is the system of governments that encompasses the known empire, essentially, which is huge. And then finally, we have the Spacing Guild. So I talked about Spacing Navigators. We have the Spacing Guild. It is the interstellar shipping and trade conglomerate that is very important for space travel, politics, policy, international law under the Carino Empire. It is a very important political presence, kind of a important tripod, leg of the tripod, in terms of keeping the universe rolling and moving and shaking. The guild was also a mental physical training school established after the Butlerian Jihad, and it has a monopoly on space travel. So hopefully Dune Part 2 will get a little bit more into the politics and the inner workings of the governing bodies and the powers that be, and you will see just how important the Spacing Guild is. Keep in mind, the Spacing Guild has to either help approve charge fees for any kind of interplanetary travel. Because when you see the Sardaukar come in in the middle of the night and start effing shit up on Dune, you also know that no one can move from planet to planet in this world without the Spacing Guild. That is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed our little Dune history lesson. Let me know what you think in the comments. I am going to go see Dune Part 2 in just about a week. It could not come quick enough. I already know some spoilers. I already know some things that they change between the book and the movie because I just can't wait. If you would like, I will do a breakdown of the book versus the movie or if you just want to see a Dune Part 2 analysis, do let me know in the comments. If you are more interested in the book versus movie dynamics, let me know. If you just want to hear what I have to say about Dune Part 2, also let me know. Thank you so much for your support. Every subscriber, every like, every comment, you guys have no idea how much this means to me. I'm a small channel. I love this. This is my passion. Just knowing that even one person watched the video means so much to me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching and I will talk to you later. Have a great week and if you do go see Dune Part 2, I hope you get an extra large popcorn and literally all the treats that your heart desires because it's a long movie. We need sustenance as we watch that movie and I am just ready to fall on the floor in awe after I see it. Take care. Love you so much. I will talk to you later. Bye.